Warning. Watch very closely now. Three, two, one. Bzow! Check that out. The following podcast features terrible jokes. You know you can use uh, Hot Wheels cars when you need to make a saving throw in D&D? Every car is die cast. Usually about board games. We want the fun. <laughs> Gotta have that fun. <laughs> <laughs> Must insist that no one attempt to recreate any joke performed on this podcast. We had less technical issues than a million dollar company. All Woo-hoo! right. This <laughs> is Boards and Swords. So, hey everybody, welcome to Boards and Swords. This is a podcast featuring uh, bad jokes, uh, plenty of good folks, and some tabletop games. And we are live here at the Nova Open 2023. Live! Cue applause. Woo! <laughs> so, as you can see, we are not here. Uh, there, there are always just me and Philip, besides me and Philip in the room. So, I'm Chris Renshaw. This is my partner in crime, Mr. Philip Herbig. What's going on, everybody? Um, and then we also have people more famous than I am, uh, <laughs> more more on YouTube than I am. We have Adam and Vince from Snarling Badger Studios, although you know them probably more from Tabletop Minions and Warhammer Weekly. Sure. Mm-hmm. So how's how's y'all's convention doing? It's uh, it's been it's been good. It's uh, it's starting to wind down, and uh, I can tell because my body is letting me know that yeah. it's winding down, and that it is <laughs> that I'm winding down. So uh, yeah, it's uh, definitely one of those things that I'm glad it's not another day after that. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I'm glad it's not till Monday. So yeah. Although I feel like yours is just beginning, since from what I hear, you're going to be going to all hours of the evening judging. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, I stepped away from judging to come down here and do this, and so well, we got we made a lot of good progress, and then there'll be. There'll be much more after this, that's right. Mm-hmm. Judging the Capitol Palette, uh, which is bigger this year than ever, had uh, basically 700 entries. That was over, that's, up over that's 450 yeah. from last year. Uh, if you want to think about it this way, uh, about 10% of the people who attended this had a wow. had a entry in there. So. And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna ask you how your convention was because he just got here. That's, that's uh, it's it's great it's freaking awesome so far, man. Okay. <laughs> uh, I just want to how how what what did you submit for Capital Palette? Uh, two things. I two submitted things. Yeah. Two things. Do you know what the numbers are? No, I don't. Right there? No. Okay, gotcha. What you think? A couple hundred bucks. We can get <laughs> I've, I've probably already judged them, so oh, okay. it's, it's too right, late. Gotcha. You missed the window. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm just gonna say we normally this we, we always start off the show with some news. Um, however, this is not going to have any GW news. We did a whole stream on that. So just go back and look at the YouTube channel for all the Nova open reveals. Not going to cover those. So, uh, first of all, uh, are you going to play the thing? Are you saying, okay, that's fine. Just picture. Uh, anybody know where the thermostat is? It's getting awfully worms in here. Oh. I told you these are bad. Oh, that's horrible. So uh, we, we, we talked about this. We actually had the, the, one of the people from Manic Games come on the show, but uh, uh, Worms, the Worms, Worms, the board game is now available on Kickstarter. You can back this right now. It's actually, it said it funded in like 13 minutes. I think it was. Have you seen this? I've seen some, some talk about it. I haven't seen the Kickstarter. It wrong. looks really, I was very skeptical when I first heard that they were going to make a Worms board game, but especially after we talked to, to Ronnie and kind of, mm-hmm. kind of got the idea for, I was like, how do you do like the, the terrain and like, oh, it's like 2D, not 3D. Sure. So, uh, but, and then you see the, you see the, all the different minis. It's actually really cool. And there's only, you looked at the Kickstarter as well. Like I two, did. Two there's, pledges. There, there are two pledges. There's the game and then there's the everything. Yeah. And that's it. Mm-hmm. No, uh, no, no stretch goals. No, they were doing uh, daily reveals yeah. of their, of what's going to be in the. hundred dollars or 79 pounds. If you're in the UK, 79 pounds. So, uh, and with all the stuff, it, it might actually weigh 79 pounds. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's a lot of stuff. Did you, uh, have you backed it? I have not. You did not? Are you going to? Did you I'm, hit the I'll, notify I'll, me? I'll, I'll, I'll did, I did hit, hit the, the notify, notify me, all right? As soon as that 48 hours hits. <laughs> all right. Uh, so, uh, I was so happy to see this next story. I got a bit doctor up. And that is, uh, so we, this, this is another game that's coming out. So, uh, I know. Everybody knows about Doctor Who, right? What? Doctor Who? Who? Yeah, what? I haven't it doesn't ring a bell. So, they are making a This is this is weird. It's it's a D&D 5E version of the role-playing game and it's called Doctors and Daleks. I don't really think it seems bad. It does. Like raise your hand if you think that's a bad idea. I, no. I, I <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't think it's a good idea. That's not a good idea. So, 
I don't know. It's it, it's a thing. If you like if you like Doctor Who, you probably have already like pre ordered it. More than likely. It'll still probably be uh uh it'll still probably sell like dog or hotcakes. That was the word. I went there brain we dead go. there. I almost I said dog no cakes. Idea. That isn't even a thing. Usually amongst my friends we like to say wild cakes. Wild like, cakes. Yeah, I like that. Because it's like it's just a you know, a mix up of uh you know, like wildfire or like, you know, hot cakes and so one of us said it one time, and now we all just say it all the time. And everyone else thinks we're nuts, which is fine. Never really seen a line for hotcakes as it is anyway. So. Not really, no. <laughs> They're pretty much available freely at any point in time from yeah, yeah. many and assorted restaurants Depends. without any kind of wait. McDonald's like changed it now to where you can't get like breakfast all day. I think it depends on the location the, and the particular... Uh, menu items in question that you might want from that location. They yeah. vary their breakfast availability by geogra- geographic location. Uh, check with your local store for full details. <laughs> <laughs> this is like the end of the commercial where it's like <laughs> purchase not offer required. not valid in all states. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, Extra tax in Alaska and Hawaii. Do you know how much it costs to recycle? Uh, 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 I uh, about tree fifty. Tree fifty. <laughs> so, uh, has anybody heard of Team Covenant? They do. A, if you play card games at all, you might be familiar with them. Yeah, I've talked to the. the I, I don't play card games, but I've talked to them at uh, conventions before. Yeah. So they've partnered up with uh, Andrew Navarro, who has kind of jumped from a. He was the head of Fantasy Flight Games. Then he went to Chip Theory Games, and now he started his own company, trying to do more eco-friendly games. And they they announced their first one, kind of in partnership with. Uh, with uh, Team Covenant, and it's called Earthborn Rangers. So, like, the entire game is supposed to be, uh, like, the most eco-friendly you can get. Like, 100% uh, FT, FSC, I don't know who that is, certified paper, uh, German manufacturing with paper for German force, no plastic coatings, no shrink wrap, vegetable-based inks. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Aside from the staples in the rule book, everything is recyclable and or compostable. So, like, if you hate the game... It's not going to fill up your landfill. <laughs> right, throw it in your compost pile. Uh, but it actually sounds really cool. Like the, 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 I mean, it's it's not a cheap game. It, it's a hundred dollars is the core set. Right. Yeah. Uh, this is a card game. Yeah, it's a customizable cooperative card game set in the wilderness of the far future. Um, we describe it as a different genre of expandable card game, one, one that is more akin to open world role playing games, where exploration and story are the focus. Uh, go where you want, do what you want, wander aimlessly, discover what's out there. That's this is I'm reading from the release page about it. And right. I mean, as soon as they said story, I was like, "All right, I'm, 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 I'm you got me suckered." <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very, especially you know, like I said, Andrew Navarro, who's got a history of Fantasy Flight games. Yep, yep. This guy buys just about everything Fantasy Flight. Um, so uh, they've already got they've already got me kind of hooked there so i'm definitely curious to see more from that as it comes out uh all right and we'll do one last we'll do one last story uh and this one's just for you phil okay um philip isn't a big fan of of this next setting and uh philip why don't you tell everybody about the first time you ever played D fifth edition oh yeah yeah first first time um uh i did not have to re-roll a character However, I did get one shotted by uh, immediately. Immediately. So immediately. Uh, hey, Philip, what's your passive perception? I'm like a uh, thirteen. All right, roll shit, roll shit, roll, and you're dead. <laughs> so if you've ever played D and D Fifth Edition, they came out with the the D and D starter set, and it had an adventure called the Lost Minds of Fandelvere, and the very first scenario, very first encounter. It's just like, oh, you find a horse in the road. And he's like, well, I'm going to go take a look at that horse. I'm like, uh, what's your passive perception? Because it turns out there's goblins like waiting for you, and they like immediate. And uh, anybody that's played D&D 5th Edition can tell you that f- level one heroes, extremely deadly. Like, you only have like six hit points. Mm-hmm. So it was just like, oh, um, yeah, you're dead. <laughs> so uh, I, I said all that because apparently a lot of people, apparently a lot of people play D&D 5th Edition. Who knew? That's a still thing. Nostalgia is a hell of a drug, or so the saying goes. <laughs> so apparently they're they're wanting to make a new source book that's called Fandelavir and Below 
Uh, I'm probably saying that wrong. I'm really sorry. Uh, the Shattered Obelisk with Returns to the Village where 5th Edition's official adventures began. So you do start at level one again. So it's not like your characters are re-revisiting uh, the Lost Mines, but it's supposed to be like an homage to and kind of fleshing it out into like a full adventure. Um, kind of goes on my idea that they can't come up with new stuff, so they just keep kind of going back to the well of stuff they've already done. There's nothing new. There's never anything new. Well, sure. But so yeah, that's uh, that's the news. At least the non GW non <laughs> non other th uh, miniatures news. But uh, so let's turn it over to uh, Adam and Vince. And why don't you guys tell us about sure. so Snarling Badger Studios? Uh, it was this was this a outcome of the? Because uh, I know a lot of your games started out around the time of the the pandemic. So was this kind of because of that? To some degree, yeah. We. Um I had the idea for Rain and Hell sometime uh, previous to 2019, and um, I, I started talking with Vince about like you know because I know he's a, a game designer, and and I was like you know let's I've got this idea and we could do these things and all this kind of stuff, and we've been friends for a while, and we were kind of like yeah let's 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 take a look at that, and then um, there wasn't a lot of forward movement on it, and then along came uh, the, the the pandemic, and sometime in I don't want I want to say October of 2020, all of a sudden uh, we were just uh, both of us were like most people were bored, uh, just <laughs> really bored because nothing was going on, no one was going anywhere. So yeah, I uh, I said well, let's let's start working on this, and then we did, um, and about halfway through the process we. I just mentioned one night, I'm like, I mean, do you want to keep doing this after like, once we get this done, do you want to do another one and like make a company of it? Or is this just like a one-off? And, and uh, yeah, so we kind of went from there. Um, the, the concept was basically, I mean, the, the guiding principle to, to some degree is to try to make games that are accessible. You know, we're going to be making miniature games. We're not particularly at this point at, or really have any plans to actually make miniatures. We just want to make rule sets for miniature agnostic games, make them uh, inexpensive. Our most expensive game currently costs 19 bucks plus, uh, plus shipping. Um, and that's the newest one, right? The yeah, Majestic, Majestic 13? Majestic 13, yeah. So the second game was, uh, was Vince's idea. It was an idea that he'd had over uh, the course of quite some time to be do uh, more like a, uh, it was a role-playing idea. And uh, we moved it into, and that was Space Station Zero. So it worked, it's a, uh, yeah, and then the third one, and now we're working on the next one, and we're gonna we basically do them once a year. So, so uh, why don't you give us like a, the, the quick elevator pitch for each one? So you started with Rain and Hell. Rain and Hell is a brutal, uh, demonic skirmish combat between uh, uh, cabals of demons, and uh, it's post-apocalyptic hell, and they fight each other, and so you build yourself a cabal. Um, you find models to use for your demons. Anything can be a demon if you believe in yourself, and uh, you just kind of go from there. Space Station Zero, you are a crew of people on a spaceship, and you are, um, you, you know, you've, you've been making a jump from point A to point B, and you don't get to point B. You get someplace else, and you're kind of stuck out in the middle of nowhere, and there's nothing, like not a s speck for, for, you know, hundreds of thousands if not millions of light years and except there's this one really big space station like right there so you land there and it's uh, kind of a mystery and you're trying to figure out how to get you know so it's a branching narrative sci-fi skirmish kind of a game and again a lot of survivalist stuff. elements too yeah exactly a lot of survival elements as well and then the most recent game uh, majestic 13 is kind of if you ever played XCOM or watched x files it's got a lot of it's a it's an alien hunting style game where you're trying to go out as a group to fight against aliens that are landing in urban areas, wilderness areas, that kind of stuff. So, um, again, the thing that's nice about that game is that um, if you're if one of your models dies, it's uh, you can just get a clone because uh, you've got a clone back in the you know back at base. It may you know be a touch freezer burned. It may not quite necessarily be <laughs> like to the same level as you were before, but uh, that's okay. It's kind of a, a thing you roll on. We're, we're we're very interested in, in campaign play in yeah. all of these games as well. Kind of reminds me of uh, uh, have you ever played Eve Online? Sure, familiar with it. Yeah. That's that's what when you're talking about like the the if you die that that kind of piece where like depending on where you saved your backup is 
how far back you get kicked if right. you if you die. I think we we talked about that at some point because you used to play, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. We talked about. I, I mean, there isn't many MMOs I haven't played when it comes out. <laughs> I was a big MMO player since uh, Ultima Online, and you know, all of the games what they have in common is because they all have very different rules. Some are more versus focused like for example with rain on hell the initial launch is really very versus focused and then we launched a standalone pdf that adds solo and co-op play and takes you through a, a sort of narrative set of adventures space station zero is much more uh solo and co-op focused straight out of the gate though it does have a versus element to it uh and same with honestly the same with majestic 13 but in a very different way. Majestic 13 is taking you through this sort of like programmatically generated set of encounters against these monsters. There's a lot of randomness as to what you're going to what you're going to run into. Some of the situations can be quite 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 deadly. And so like evac is the right answer. Um, but you have options uh, whereas with uh, Space Station 0, you're, you know, it's this survivalist effectively almost horror scenario where you're deciding to go down into the depth of this ancient space station uh, that is, you know, huge beyond imagination. And, you know, past a certain point in the early game, you can't go back. That's it. Like, you're, you, either, you either get to the end or you die. Those are the only options. And if you die, you're dead. Campaign over. Start again. Right? There's no, there's no save points. There's no return. It's just that's it. That's what you're doing. So, you know, as a result of that, there's uh, – each one feels very different in how it plays. And that's, that's kind of how we approach all of them when we – Look at a game and start with the concept and then work our way down. Like, what are the rules for this should be? So uh, they end up having completely different rules, use different dice, have different activation systems, different building, you know, sort of like a, a team crew warband building elements and, and all of that sort of stuff. Because we, we everything should be uh, set to the game in question. So we yeah, always try to make it so all the rules are set to fit in with that game the rules are bespoke to each game they're not designed it's not like we came up with a, with a an system engine. and then just yeah, came and up with flavors put different skins on top of it yeah like you know the the activation in uh rain and hell makes sense within the story the way it's done that way uh, in comparison to other games and other types of activation and the activation in space station zero is a different thing and the same thing in uh, uh majestic 13 they're they're all different in that fashion so where do you get your as far as uh I mean, is it just from a long history of playing different games that you kind of build? Like, I'm going to pick the... I remember I liking this mechanic in this game and this mechanic in this game, or... Yeah, I mean, in game design, you're always kind of pulling from other games. I think the best game designers have looked at and played a lot of games. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so... And the way we sort of work with, with most of the rules writing is... We both sort of concept and lay out things to together with our guiding principles and what do we want the story of this to be, and then you know talk about some of the things that we would or wouldn't want in the game at like a high level. And we think the game should have this kind of thing, this kind of feel, this kind of rule, and then I kind of go away and and you know sort of detail that out. Like I take the the pass at all the rules writing, and then and then you know Adam and I get together quite regularly, and then. We go through everything with a fine tooth comb and say, you know, does this pass the smell test? So Adam is my first uh, reviewer, developer, effectively, <laughs> right? Um, and keeping me honest as to whether or not what I've said or done here or projected is is completely lunatic or, or not. I get I get to play the average consumer, so right. he'll you know we'll read. You have through no experience rule. in this. Yeah, we'll read through the rule and then I'll be like, does that make sense? And or that or or or, or that's really cool or whatever you know. But it's a, I'm kind of first reaction, which which helps. Um, and then uh, generally, what, you know, once all the design is done and the, the uh, um, uh, playtesting is done and the development is done and all, going through and kicking all of the tires and trying to break it as much as possible so that everything's ready, then, and then editing is done, then it kind of gets into my lap and I do um, layout and design as far as all that kind of stuff, the visual stuff. Uh, generally, I've been working already with artists, mm -hmm. you know, or, or an art an artist, or maybe sometimes multiples, uh, to move into, you know, have that stuff ready to go. So when it's layout time, I'm not like waiting on artists and all that kind of stuff. And then um, we we do things very. We try to do things very DIY. We work with a company called Wargame Vault, mm -hmm. which is underneath the whole kind of drive-through RPG. I was going to say, I thought that was it was the 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 way you have the the print print to, or uh, print on demand. Print on demand. Yes, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. 
And again, we've had people ask us, they're like, well, why don't you make a hardcover? Or well, why don't you make the insides color and that kind of stuff? And we're like, well, then it's not going to be an 18 or $19 yeah, book exactly. for sure, you know? And so we're always, like I said, uh, thinking about that whole concept about uh, accessibility and everything. And um, we've had people in the industry, most recently at uh, Gen Con, uh, ask it, you know, like so, so, you know, ask about the game and everything, and we tell them about the game, and then we tell them about the price, and they're like, "That's you guys have that set way too low. You're not doing it." <laughs> like, well, man, that's we're 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 happy with what we got, and we both have, you know, this is not either of our day jobs. Yeah, you're not trying to get rich off of this. Right. This is just you want to see your something you made on a shelf some or like on a table somewhere. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, and it's it's awesome to see people in the, in the Discord. We see it all the time, people who are making amazing things, you know, because they're excited about the game and they're making amazing products and stuff. Yeah. Have you ever had uh, people make, like take the images in the book and make like 3D models of them? Yeah. Yeah, we've had, uh, um, after Space Station Zero came out, there were a couple of different sculptors there was one that was going through and trying to find like the images and then like there's a couple different illustrations where you're you've got a person or a monster or alien or whatever kind of in profile and so he was taking those and using that as a basis to be able to make and he was basically making stls of just the heads mm -hmm. and then kind of sharing it out you know he was like is that okay we share it we're like well if you're not charging for it that's nothing we can tell you know we can't say no necessarily or anything and it's fine so it's cool uh again we like that diy thing so yeah there are people out there who've got like you know, uh, heads that they can then put on and, you know, because the game's very much, all the games are kind of about kit bashing or it doesn't even have to be kit bashing. Like the aliens that you go up against in, um, you know, the in Majestic 13, again, anything can be an alien as long as you believe in yourself, you know, just, you just get some sort of weird D and D monster, spray it with like a iridescent type paint and then boom, done alien. So, um, yeah, that kind of stuff. Um, we've had people do sculpting like that. We've had also people just make, uh, just full out, characters not necessarily based off of the any of the specific illustrations but based off of like you know just other stuff or things that, are, that they're like this is what i'm going to be using in my war band and i sculpted this whole thing and you know whatever program and everything and it's just amazing to see i don't know if i think i saw a true scale uh primary space marine i think that was pretty alien too sure yeah <laughs> and people use you know uh space marines and taus uh, taus that's not the right person. yeah taus taus okay um that use those type of things in games like uh you know space station zero and stuff so um we you know we basically want to make it so that either you use models you've already got which is obviously very inexpensive since you already have them or we want you to be able to use models that you've always been like i like that model a lot yeah that's really cool but i don't have a game for it well maybe now you do you know so that's kind of the general idea you know cool uh so when you're when you're like trying them out though do you have specific, like when you're designing the game, like I'm designing it for like this model that's been on, I've been wanting to use. Like when you get into that place, I was like, what are you using specifically to try and like, do you try and find something somewhat in the theme you're thinking of? For playtesting, it can be generally any kind of model as long as yeah. it's the right size. Yeah, I mean, when I'm, <clears throat> when, you know, when we're going through, I really don't have anything in mind. Like as we, as we make the stuff, it's kind of amorphously whatever's in your head. Um, when I do my play testing, I'm usually using proxies for everything. Like I don't have time to, like I don't play test alone. I have a developer who play tests as well. We have, we have other people who we bring in to help us play test, mm -hmm. usually four or six people. And like it just, it's placeholders. Like I'll just, I remember, I think I tested, um, I think I tested most of Space Station Zero using, like uh, hero quest skeletons as all the aliens. Like yeah. that was just, they stood in every single encounter, no matter how many I needed. I just had a bunch of them, right? So I was like, hey, these are work. Um, like I just, it's just something to be there and exist because I just needed to, to be present so I can test the, the rules and the interaction and stuff like that. I guess I, I should have started with, do you even use miniatures? Because I guess in the, even in early development, it's like you could go the, the old school battle tech and just like, oh, here's a standee or a piece of paper sure. that just has. Or just a die. Or a die, yeah. For sure, yeah. Yeah, I mean, for the most part, yes, yeah, just because it's easier to, to have the physical thing in the space, right? We're just more comfortable with it as humans. But, um, but yeah, because, like, the testing the primary loops and stuff like that is really the, the sort of first priority. And so when I do simple and basic testing like that, that kind of stuff, I just use whatever's handy. How do you – so th this is probably just different types of games for different types of people, but I know when I play – games a lot of time i'm kind of like ooh, i want to try everything i think like sure. 40k is probably one of the, f the ones i've been playing the most and that's honestly because there's a group that's just there every week playing but 
I imagine because you know when you're play testing a game, you got to play it over and over. You know, you got to generate all yeah, that. Sure. Mm. Does it ever get just like by the end of you're like, I'm so tired of this game? Sure, of course. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, when you've been working on something like we don't generally end up working on a project for. You know, we talk to people from time to time. We're like, oh, I've been working on this game for four years or five years. And between the two of us, we're kind of always like, man, that's maybe, I don't know, three or four years too long, honestly. Like, yeah, you know, yeah, you exactly. Because most of our projects are about six to nine months. Yeah. and we're But we're also making, like, our longest book is 144 pages, and that's the most recent one, Majestic 13. And we're trying to really not go beyond that if we can help it. And there's a lot of people out there that are, you know, I'm going to design this game. It's going to become an ecosystem. This is how I'm going to be able to, you know, live the rest of my life. And, and then this is the thing going forward and everything. And we're kind of like, we're going to make this game and we're going to make this game. And th the idea is that you see a lot of people specifically in miniatures who say, this is the wagon to which I will, no, no this is the star to which I will hitch my wagon. Uh, and so that's the game that they play. But there's also a decent amount of people out there who also like to play a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of yeah. this. And it's the difference between do you only watch this one movie or do you only read this one maybe series of books? You just read the Harry Potter stuff and that's it, nothing outside. Or do you like to read a lot of different books? So um, we, we feel it's important for people to try out different games. And when they're miniature agnostic like that and inexpensive, you don't have to go, well, if I'm going to play this game, i got to buy all new models and i yeah. got to do this yeah, and yeah. get some terrain and all that kind of stuff. You can be like, okay, well, these guys are going to fit in this part and this is going to work here. And if you want to do some bespoke things, that's super cool too. But you, you can also start out and just see if you even like the game by just using the stuff you generally have. Right. Yeah, that seems to be – there. there is like – I don't know if it's more of just me learning more about the hobby, but it seems like in the past four-ish years, you've seen this kind of wave of miniatures agnostic uh, games sprout up. Yeah, I mean, it's maybe a little bit longer than that, but yeah, no, it is a relatively recent thing for sure. Um, you know, it, for the longest time, it was like if you weren't in the big company that had the affiliated uh, miniatures line, then you were probably playing historicals. Yeah. And I think a lot of people have taken, in, especially in our space, have taken some, some kind of... Uh, you know, ideas from historicals where if, if you look at historical games out there, the companies that make the models are almost never the companies that make the rules and vice versa. You know right. what I mean? Like, so, um, and I'm not a big historical player, but I've, I've paid attention to that stuff over the years. And so it's, it's really interesting to kind of see the light kind of coming on in people's heads going, you know, I could take these guys that I used in Zona Alpha and then repurpose them and have them also be my team in Majestic 13 and that kind of stuff. And yeah, I like to double dip whenever I can do it. Like not, you know, with chips, that's <laughs> but like in, in other situations, it's great. Especially when you get like, you get in the hobby long enough and you're like, I just have a shelf full of minis that like, exactly. I've never, yeah. I haven't played that game in forever, but I painted mm -hmm. it so well, I'm never going to like sell it or anything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the real goal here is just to get more value out of the things you already have, right? If, if the minis you already have work in more games that, that we make or other people make that are in that miniatures agnostic range, like how is that not better for everyone, right? That's just great value. Like these five to ten minis are they're playing in this game, they're playing in this game, and now they have a third game. I can have three different things depending on what my friends want to do when they come over um, with this same group of minis. Like what, what a great stretch the value. Yeah. But then again, also, if you do want to be like, I really want to make this new thing or make that new thing or whatever, you can totally do that. It's totally up to you. But it's not, you know, it's very difficult for you to get into 40K without, let's say, getting 40K models. You right. Know what I mean, but, you know, that's why we're, we're the, the miniature agnostic movement. And there's a lot of us out there uh, is kind of trying to, I don't want to say get around that, but basically give you other options. Yeah. I just had the greatest you know brain blast if you will all right so 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 philip here uh he has bought quite quite a many of the uh power rangers heroes of the grid i've bought everything they put out mm -hmm. yeah so so dollars wise like this guy's got a 40k army and a half worth of <laughs> in power money rangers spent minis. yep however the one thing i've noticed about that game is it does have a lot of minis but it's not a really minis game like it's it's more of just like you're a marker that you're kind of moving to different sections of the board uh -huh. however could you imagine playing the way that they're describing that uh was it majestic, majestic thir 13, 13 yeah. but with the power rangers and then the the aliens from the hero the various power rangers aliens all right because uh, yeah they all the all the episodic monsters have their own 
many. Yeah. I mean, Put them out there. Those, those yeah. monsters were probably aliens, right? They weren't from around here. No. no. Yeah, no. there you go. Boom. They were in that space trash can. Yeah, exactly. Or no, they were made out of clay. They were made out of clay, though, is what they were made out of, yeah. Yeah, like, what was it, Finster? Was Finster, that yep. Hmm. Or at least that in, in, in that series. I don't, I don't know if they showed the rest of the series, how they got made. They didn't. Well, some of them were escaped convicts. Yeah. In SPD oh, that's true. It depended on the. Force. It depended yeah, on the depend, series. Yeah. So, uh, from the chat room, uh, Rusty Beetle asks. He said that you filmed a black and white skit of two gamers playing a minis game, like waiting for your turn at the period of a long time. Somebody's like, "Whose turn is it?" That was a long time ago. Yeah. Yeah. He's yeah. wanting to know if you're ever going to make more skits like that because they were fantastic. Yeah, I, I, I think about it. Pretty frequently, actually, I did two different skits, and I called them "Tales of the Tabletop Minions" or something along like that. So, and there was one uh, where you know we were sitting, we're standing across from each other playing a game, and like I get a text on my phone, and I pick it up, and I'm like kind of answering it. And I think it was my turn, and then my opponent is visually like unhappy about the fact that I'm just quickly texting and responding to this. And then he gets a text, and then he picks up his phone, and he's answering to it. And then we're both kind of answering and answering, and then eventually we both set our phones down, and now we're looking at the other, like, when are you going to go? It's your turn, right? <laughs> and then, like, we, at this point, we've forgotten whose turn it yeah. is. Uh, and then I did one about a rules lawyer thing too. Um, recently, with the in, uh, the kind of, you know, influx of youtube shorts yeah i've been considering like how can i do some of those very quickly vertically that are like a minute or less but still have kind of value um and so i don't know i've got i've got a couple of ideas actually right now that i've been kind of kicking around but it's they're the, for a minute long video they're kind of bigger ideas which yeah. kind of can you know put, put them a little bit on minute long video doesn't take a minute long to make no that would be <clears throat> super cool if it did though yeah <laughs> so is it, I mean, you know, another comment talking about how it takes a lot of capital to start a minis company. However, if you're just making minis agnostic, it makes things a lot cheaper and you can devote more. To, is that, that sure. I had to make that was a, a serious consideration into when you're doing this. So just like, hey, you know, it'd be a whole lot simpler if we just made the rules and then. Yeah, I mean, you know, we didn't. We've had people ask us over and over again, like, well, why don't you guys make miniatures for your games? And we're like, it's too much work. It's crazy. It's a crazy, if, especially for the, 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 the release schedule that we want to hit, it's not possible. Right. And again, you know, with the idea of miniatures agnostic, it, there's, there's, you know, there, there's already, there's companies out there already making miniatures for our games. They're called every other company out there. And yeah. so that's fine. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I, I, I we know enough about the industry to know we don't want to head down that direction particularly. Right, because then you're talking a whole different, even mon money aside, just sure. logistics. Yeah, logistics, time, warehousing, um, you know, fulfillment, like all that kind of stuff. Or even if you just go the STL route, they're still getting sculptors and all that kind of stuff and testing and everything. So, Initial yeah. cost, number of contractors, number of contracts, number of time you're spending an email, communicating with those people, yeah. amount of time you're then fishing out additional work when you have holes or things that fail through, fail checks, quality assurance, mm -hmm. uh, holding product, shipping product, returning, getting returned product because of people's unhappiness or failed product or anything like that. Like top to bottom, it is an absolute... A uh, lot of work, and yeah. like it's great if you're a big company and you have staff that can do that. But you know, to us, it's, it's like it's, no, they already, they already make managers. Exactly what Adam said for yeah. our games. There's a ton of them out there. It's bunched mm -hmm. down in the exhibit hall. You yeah, can go exactly. get them right now. Many miniatures for Space Station Zero and Majestic Thirteen are available now. You exactly. can find them under other games' names. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, they might be labeled other games, but trust me, they work just fine for they our. They do, games. and yeah. and rabble rabble. I this is this is exactly what these guys are going for. He says, just print a face on some cardboard. Bring back Pogs. <laughs> There's no reason you couldn't. Yeah, no, absolutely not. I, I mean, now I need to see a game, a minis game system that uses Pogs. Yes. As a <laughs> It's not for me. I mean, honestly, there was a game that that was that basically used Pogs. Uh, Fantasy Flight used to make a game called Disc Wars. Oh, and it had like okay. a, it had a, a license with. Um, there Star was a Warhammer one, well, wasn't it was there? Star Trek, and there might have been a Warhammer one too. But I remember seeing the one for Star Trek, and so you'd have this ship, and then your movement was literally just flipping it, and like the, the bigger ships could move further, like per, ah. and it was a whole thing. And yeah, and sometimes I don't, I don't think you ever actually had to slam down. To <laughs> there was none of that necessarily, but they were basically like big pogs. So yeah, nearly everything has been done under the sun. So how do you, so you, you were talking about how much you um, design the various systems. How do you keep them from being, you know, just carbon copies with a different theme paste on it? How do you, how do you make rules that make each game seem special 
without them kind of bleeding together. Sure. So, I mean, when we start the general process is we start with sort of a generic concept of what we want to want to do. And then we create a set of guiding principles. So these are like five, six, either words or short phrases that tell exactly what the point of the game is. So like in Rain and Hell's case, that's like brutal skirmish combat, uh, demons, post-apocalyptic hell, uh, you know, fight for supremacy or something like that. Right. So those were the, those were the guiding principles. And so then when I, when I think about each element of the mechanics, like I don't start with any preconceived notions other than like, well, okay, we have to have some kind of activation system. Right. So, okay. What makes sense in this, in this world? Right. And what are the interesting mechanics we could do? Like this, as a point of fact, like the, the rain and hell activation system is one of my, one of my favorite little pieces of mechanic tech I've, I've ever created. I just think it's fun and it fits the game really, really well. And when it came time to, to space station zero, it was a completely different show, like a completely different thing. You had PVE much more than PVP and you had, um, different concerns as to what the players are going to be up against and how much uh, they were going to be expected to interact with the scenario and stuff like that. So so we had to have a completely different system, right? Like it, the, everything is derivative from those initial concepts and the theming and the feel that you want, right? Um, so as I'm thinking about things like stats and stuff like that, I'm, I'm, I'm just really appealing back to like, what is this game about? Uh, and you know, when it came to stuff like, um, uh, majestic 13, for example, if you look, I keep talking about activation systems just cause it's an easy thing to talk right. about. Um, that again was completely different than anything before. And why? Well, because it needed to be different. The aliens are bigger, stronger, faster, deadlier, more dangerous. And since it's a sort of ogre type game where you're like, you know, five guys against one enemy, generally, that's the sort of most common scenario you run into asymmetric yeah yeah this asymmetric combat you know the alien goes first like just almost not every time but the vast majority of the time the alien will just end up going first because of the nature of how the stats work out and that means the alien can put you on the back foot instantaneously because that's what the game needed to feel like mm -hmm. it needed to feel like the threat was on you present right now in your face you have to answer it or you are all dead right like game over man game over <laughs> like that's right. the yeah. feeling that needed to happen right um uh whereas a different game might not require that feeling of of like instant fear and dread and stuff like that coming out of it so I oftentimes do charts of like just general sort of emotion state charts of like what I want you to feel like over the course of a turn or the game or stuff like that. I think about like the experience of what's happening psychologically as you're, as you're going through there. And I try to like make sure that the rules are going to speak to that sort of experience that I want. Cause not every, not every game is meant to have the sort of same emotional peaks and valleys as you go through it. As an example, um, the activation system for uh, Bolt Action, the World mm -hmm. War II uh, 28 millimeter game, is that you have uh, a number of dice for how many units you have, and your opponent has a number of dice for how many units they have, and they're all the same size but different colors. Mm -hmm. You dump them all into a bag, and so when it's time to start a turn, you reach into the bag and you pull it a die. Oh, it's your one, so you, you get to activate somebody. And you reach in again, well, that's another one of yours. Oh, it's like Legion. The Star Wars Legion did something similar, yeah, except you picked, your, you picked your own. Yeah, but what happens is the reason that you're doing that is because because of the fog of war, explosions right. and smoke and dirt in the air and all this kind of stuff, you have to constantly react and you don't know what's going to happen next. In Rain and Hell, the you basically have a D12 for every one of your demons. You roll them all at the beginning of the turn and you see, okay, I got an 11, two 10s, uh, a 6, and a 4, and those are the phases that you're going to go in and you can pick whichever demon you want and that is because the game is like hand-to-hand -hand combat, there is no fog of war there's it's just kind of an ever-evolving scrum so as the beginning of a new turn oh it looks like you're gonna be going three times in a row because you got three nines like okay so we're gonna take so it's like the two leaders are kind of looking around the field and right. trying to figure out what's going on and going okay i see where this is headed and just you know rather than just like well let's go you go i go and there's nothing wrong with that particularly but if you've got the ability to make um something that that leads to the story and the type of combat that's happening i think it's got a lot more flavor to it and i love the the d 12 kind of activation system yeah I, I think it is we i taught right d12s after, are underutilized in I, games for sure for sure but i 
I taught the game. I went to uh, PAX East back in uh, 2022, um, and I taught the game to um, to to uh, Tycho uh, Jerry yeah. Wilkins. Uh, to him and Kiko, who's like their lead, like uh, graphic designer and stuff, and I've been communicating with them on um, on uh, Twitter and such. And as I was explaining the way the rules work, specifically the uh, the the whole activation thing, like Jerry was like, "Really? So that's you do this?" And he kind of was just like constantly like trying to catch up. He's like, "So this is how that works?" And I'm like, "Yeah." And he's just like, he got like angry. I'm like, "What's?" And he's like, "That's j- that's just really good." And just it, it like ticks <laughs> me off how good that is. And yeah. I'm like, well, you know, like why didn't I th- or somebody else think uh, of maybe that? Potentially, yeah. yeah. So yeah, it, that kind of stuff is is uh, is important. A lot of people are just like. I think in a lot of companies, they don't look at the rules as like, do they lead the story? Yeah. You know, or even follow the story in some some times. Sometimes we've picked, we come up with story, we come up with art, we come up with models, and then eh, rules will figure out later. And yeah, we're, we're kind of... We Games think, Workshop. Well, not necessarily all the time, <laughs> but some of the time, I'm not going to lie. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we, we believe that, that rules matter. We're trying to find out what the, the Latin is for rules matter so that we can have like <laughs> a, a little motto or something under our logo. All right. Well, uh, I think we, we need to hear some, uh, we need some, some, some laughter. We've been too serious here. Okay. So, uh, I, everybody on this side of the room can't see it, but there's a giant bar over here filled with games that I really don't want to take home. A giant. It's giant compared to the number of people here. Cause it means okay, just about everybody's going to walk away with stuff. All right. Um, I mean, there's games, some of them, some of them are out of shrink because they were review things that now I don't need anymore. But uh, anyways, so what I want is I want to hear some like the, the what's your worst convention kind of story. Um, and I'll, I'll start just to kind of get you in the right mindset. And we're not talking about like we're not making fun of, of people of like, oh, I this guy was smelled bad the whole time. I just like weird, weird things that make you go, huh? Uh, and and you, you'll, you'll remember this story. Uh, our first Gen Con. Yep. Yeah. Our first Gen Con uh, was 2015. And the dealer hall had closed and we were just trying to find something to do. And we we're like, oh, well, they're doing, you know, the D&D, you know, just give them a couple of generic tickets and play a D&D game. So we, we waited in like the long line, got in there, started uh, um, started playing. And about an hour, an hour in? About an hour in. It was like yeah. halfway in through the scenario. Some, we had taken like a, a pause for some people to go use the bathroom. And one of the guys was just kind of like, oh, yeah, I'm so excited to go uh, check out the vendor hall or this and that. And Philip and I look at each other and we're like, the vendor hall closed like over an hour ago. And he's like, what? And I'm like, yeah, it closed before we even started this game. And then the, the DM starts picking up the story again. And so we turn and all look at him. And then it gets to like where we need to like do initiative and stuff. And we turn and the guy is gone. Like none of us saw him leave. He is just gone. And we look up and he's walking like quickly walking down, running and running down the other way. We're like, it doesn't change the fact it's still closed. Sure, <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> So uh, if, if you got any stories, uh, I'll probably wait to hand out stuff till the very end, but uh, just so we're not fumbling over cords and such. But yeah, uh, we've also got, there's stuff up there. So um, uh, thanks to a lot of the, the, the vendors downstairs. So uh, Weird Games donated a little weird cursed keychain figurine thing. Uh, the Nations and Cannons, there's the... the uh, American Revolutionary War game. They've got like their their misfit deck is over there. Uh, the Baron of Dice donated a bunch of D3s. Apparently, you can make D3s mm-hmm. uh, and some like scatter dice. Uh, I'm trying to remember. There's even a uh, one of the what is it tabletop terrain that's downstairs. If you've been playing in the 40k GT, oh, yeah, yeah. that's right there. Uh, there's a box of that over there. So a lot of great stuff. So if you do end up with something, please go say thank you. Uh, to them, uh, and then, and then check out their booth in regards to that. So, anybody got any any some, like their best worst con story, or just somebody they play? All right, you got to come up in the mic so that it's that's the only caveat is you're gonna get stuff, but it has to go into the mic so that it'll show up on the podcast. I was just gonna. Oh, hand me yours. All right, yeah. fine, gotcha. If you want to, that's over, that's over to you. All right, my name is Dakota Herson. I'm from Hagerstown. My worst convention story comes from, I believe, I want to say not this year, but 2022, I went to Historicon in Lancaster. And what happened was I, phone's dead, essentially. And I'm looking through my backpack, and I'm like, where's my charger? And I'm, I'm just kind of sitting there. My issue is I took an Uber to get here. I am miles away. 
my, my hotel's miles away. And so I'm sitting there and it's like, hey, hey, um, hotel staff, do you have like a charger to use, USB-C? No. And so what happened eventually was, they're like, oh, by the way, there's a gas station about three blocks away, which is not three blocks away. It was about six to eight at about 11 o'clock at night in downtown Lancaster. Ooh. Oh, yeah. Running with, um, I had these uh, cheap sandals on and I ran out of breath. I'm like down through it. Like I'm starting to feel pain in my head because I'm starting to build like a headache I gradually over time, which went into the next day. And when I got home, because I eventually do charge my phone after a bit, like laying down, because I historic haunt goes forever. I finally get into the hotel room. I'm laying down and oh, my like my left side of my foot, my left foot, left side, starts feeling completely numb. It's com- all the nerves are all screwed up from it because the sandals destroyed it. Right. Uh, and then when I look at the sandals themselves, one of the straps is completely missing. So oh, I can't no. even wear it. I gotta take my other shoes, and that's probably the worst convention I've ever been. Not convention, my worst experience. Right. All of my own doing because I didn't remember to pack my charger. <laughs> I fully expect it store to end, and then I got back to the hotel room and found the charger in my pocket. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, also, Phil, that sounded like us uh, Thursday evening, yeah. uh, minus the running part. Uh, oh, oh. Also, I was thinking of uh, when he said the three blocks that turned into like eight. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, that was you, great. You want to tell great. that story? Yeah. So, uh, well, there's there's two. Of the, so we uh, Pax East. That's this the one was, I was thinking of. Yeah. This is the first. This is the first because we've gone to Baltimore Comic Con. Yeah. All right, and that is like that's still in Maryland. So yeah. This was the first we had to leave a state to go to a convention, at least for me. And uh, was, I think it was for me too. All right, gotcha. So we get there and we're like, all right, we're not going to spend a lot of money on food because that's a pain in the ass. Um, uh, we found a found a CVS. It was a Five Guys. If, it was Five Guys for yeah. lunch. That's where we went. Yeah. So we're um, okay. So we we're going to have lunch and then go buy stuff. Uh, so I, I type Five Guys in the GPS. Boom. All right. Hey, Chris, it's five minutes away. All right, let's go. We start walking, and we start walking. And we start walking, and we keep walking. I had left it set to car and not to walking. <laughs> so 25-ish minutes later, we finally arrived. at, And then you get the, oh, uh, like, crap, now we have to walk that back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I also, late, the next night, I uh, this was before we bought our handy-dandy filtering water bottles. Yeah. Um, we, we needed water. I was just dying. Um, so I put in my phone. I'm like, all right, cool. There's, this was the CVS. Um, I'm like, cool. So I go and it takes me along these roads. Uh, I don't know, it's a good three quarter mile walk to get there. And I go, I buy two cases of water, I three quarter back to the hotel. That's fine. Uh, we're going home. We walk out of the front of the hotel on the last day. We go straight across some it was like a train track because we were yeah, going to the met their their subway their subway system yeah. yeah we go across the tracks get to this go down the elevator puts us right at the stop for the bus it's going to take us to the thing that was 200 yards max the cvs was right across the street GPS had me walk yeah oh, oh so it was the same i i forgot it was the story the CVS. it was the same cvs <laughs> yeah we were having lunch earlier today, and uh, uh, we were with our friend John, and he was talk- talking about how somebody in uh, one of the painting classes that he was taking, I think it was what it was, um, decided to hit up Uber Eats to um, to order uh, a case of beer. Yeah, just a case of beer, yeah. Yeah, and he was like, well, I'll just have it delivered here, and that'll be great, and I'll have it, and it's great. Um, except he came here from Santa Monica, California, and his Uber Eats was still set oh, to no. Santa Monica, California, so he's like, I have to cancel that. That's because we, we we did the math a little bit. It would probably take about a good forty eight hours. Yeah, at least forty eight hours to drive it from Santa Monica to here in DC. And uh, normally you wouldn't think an Uber p- person would pick that up, but he needed to cancel it just in case. <laughs> or you get the person that like they don't see it until they pick it up, and like I gotta go where? Yeah, it could be that too. I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, All right, anybody lot. else? It's a, it's a bad convention. It doesn't have to be yourself, even if you've seen something. Oh, 
Sorry. Oh, that was. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tim. Um, this isn't really a bad story, just one of my favorite convention stories. PAX Unplugged, I don't know, probably six years ago, something like that. Um, there was a shut up and sit down panel, which was really well attended. It was, you know, like a really big thing, hundreds of people, and they'd Q&A at the end. Um, and I was there with a friend who's great, but has like, you know, has some like, he really, really hates audience Q&A and, you know, can like usually leaves before it starts, you know, can barely stay in the seat. But I was glad he was there for this because it was the strangest question we'd ever heard. The question starts off somewhat normal where they're basically describing when they were in college, there was this board game we played and they talked a little bit about the board game and, you know, it sounded very much like they were asking, you know, like, could they, could the panel, you know, tell them what this board game was that they forgot the name of? No. So they, as they near the end of the story, they explained that they lost it in a move or something and they asked them if they had seen their copy. They had not. <laughs> you never know. You got to know. It's you know. yeah, no. just responsible. It could be anywhere. could be anywhere. However, I will say that uh, I, I am in the same boat where I also don't like audience Q&As, especially like gaming-related things, just because nobody seems to understand that, like especially for a company when they're doing a presentation, that, that there's only so much they can say. For sure. So you get the like, oh, when's, uh, when, you know, like the, the fantasy flight when we would go uh -huh. and they'd be like, oh, when's this ship coming out for X Wing? And it's like, we cannot respond on un unannounced products. And you get like 10 people where they're just like, we cannot respond to unannounced product. <laughs> like generally, the, the, um, when Games Workshop does one of their, rev their reveals, uh, if they put Q&A at the end, it is like the worst. Yeah. You know, it's and, and a lot of people get up and leave. This year at Adepticon, um, that started, you know, the Q&A started, and a lot of people started to get up and leave. But the thing was, they had, everyone was pretty sure they were going to announce 10th edition, mm -hmm. but they hadn't yet. And so they sort of snuck this Q&A in, and as people were getting up to leave, one of the guys on stage was like, well, I hope that we don't talk about anything else after this, you know, <laughs> just reveal anything else, and people just didn't, weren't paying attention. They're like, I'm already out of here. <laughs> and so that was maybe not necessarily the best of all possible plans. This year... They decided we'll just have the Q and A out in here, and then you guys can come and talk to us, and we don't have to. And I think that probably actually worked. You know, the big companies like to iterate and kind of check these yeah. things out, and I think it was the smart move, honestly. That's I good. don't think it was the smart. We're gonna move. wait around and talk right here, right beside our storefront, where we've just given you a ten percent off coupon. Well, there's that too, but <laughs> I feel bad for the people smart. who had to sit there for two hours and and because they were like, normally a Q and A goes fifteen minutes, but they're like, yeah. well, we're gonna be here for a couple hours, and I was like, oh, that that's gotta suck. I wish it. I wish you had good on them. That. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, got a couple of questions for y'all in the chat. Will sure. Snarling Badger ever branch out besides like minis games rules? Oh, would we ever do non uh, war games? Like, yeah, would we do an RPG, a full on RPG or something like that, or a card game or anything. Yeah, like that. Um, I'll never say never. We don't have any current ideas for them. I mean, obviously, I've written lots of RPGs and stuff like that, so I I I, I have a deep love for that. Um, you know, I mean, a lot of our war games incorporate pretty heavy RPG elements into them. Um, so I mean, I'll never. I I won't say never, but um, I'll say right now we don't. Like none of our, we have about a three-year rolling roadmap that Adam and I keep of things that we're gonna do. We and cannot comment on unannounced. Games. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll say it's not on. There, there's, there is nothing like that on that roadmap. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be, I'll be, I'll be a little more transparent. Also, there was another for for uh, for your videos. Uh, are there any colors that you wouldn't be interested in covering in a hobby cheating video? No, I mean I'm. Paint with anything and everything. There's, I, I, I like all all colors. Um, there are certain colors I certainly favor and certain things I don't. Like I don't paint a lot of, if you look at the channel, I don't paint a lot of things in browns or blacks. I don't find those colors very interesting or use them very often. I find them to be kind of just like the opposite of visual interest, right? I tend to prefer more intense, bright colors, but that's personal taste. Nothing wrong with it. It's like the one thing I've seen. So I, I've, I've, you know, back uh, 2021, coming out of the pandemic, is when I started playing 40K, although mm -hmm. I'd been painting and playing other minis games for years. And uh, when I started looking at, like, oh, do I want to get into, like, 40K or do I want to get into AOS? Because the one thing you saw is just it seemed like there were different 
palettes in general that people were using is like you get the grim dark where everything's mm -hmm. really shaded and there's only like a couple of colors and everything's toned down. And then you go to AOS where there's a whole bunch of monsters and you're seeing like pinks and purples and neon colors that you would not hardly ever see. Uh, that was kind of it's kind of always refreshing whenever I go see all the the forty or the AOS minis like go walking around in the 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 hall here. The thing that's really interesting about the miniatures hobby is that it it can especially the the painting part is it's it's however you want to do it, you know. So however whatever kind of style you like to do it in, whatever whatever kind of color palette, whatever you have access to all that kind of stuff, and there's not a wrong way. Sometimes people will say. Well, your ultramarines should probably be blue, shouldn't right. they? Right, and you can be like, not if I don't want them to. You know? <laughs> Especially and, now, it doesn't matter as much. Yeah, and then yeah, and and that's I think that's a good move on their part, honestly, too, in my opinion. I know there are people out there that are like, nope, these guys should be like this, and you should have to do that, but they want to make it accessible as well, just like we want to make our games accessible. Yeah, they should divorce from as much of that like IP sort of requirement as as humanly possible. Yeah, yeah. Plus, it just gets hard. To, like you know, people get like, why isn't this game balanced? It's like, well, you design a game with twenty four different factions sure. and making each one individually playable and also competitive at the same time. And make ten editions of it. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Exactly. It's it's. <laughs> I made it. I made a video years ago about the illusion of balance. Yeah. And how you know people talk about how they really got to balance this better, and this company's got to balance that better, but it's it's basically nearly impossible. There are definitely super huge pain points you can look for. Like we do that. Our developer goes through and tries to find all the ways to break the game after you know after we've started designing, and that's the point. You don't want there to be a break, a total break. Right. It happens in every game. You see it in Magic. You see it in all kinds of different games. There could be some sort of combination where you did this and you did this and you did this, and then this happens, and now it's either unwinnable or you can't not win, one of the two. But with Magic, you've got, what, 65 70 thousand cards they've released i mean different cards over the over the years in the last 25 or 30 years or whatever yeah. it's around 35 right now but oh, yeah it's it, a lot okay. it's it seems, a lot it seems like more and so it's very difficult to to try to like you know so with, with us with a single game we try to make things obviously so they don't break and so that there's not like an only way to win or an only way to lose or whatever but we you know no game is ever perfectly unless it's like well even chess like the person who goes first wins five percent more of the time, or something like that. Yeah. I, I'd read oh. something. So you know, nothing's balanced really. So uh, just while we're talking about balance, what are your thoughts on how like GW's done it recently, where uh, you know, like every, where with the advent of the internet, they can be like, oh hey, here's a quarterly update to the rules. I think it's a very smart move on their part to not put the points in anything that they print anymore. You know, so don't don't put it on the cards, don't put it in the codices, things like that. Just, you know, uh, putting out a PDF document that people can get at for the points. It just makes a lot of sense, I think. Um, X-wing figured that out when they went to second edition too. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Well, uh, I know there's there's a lot going on, and I know there's a there's a big uh, music thing that's good that just started too, and certain people have to get back to. I do to have create. to get back to judging. So yes. I, I will go ahead. Uh, I will wrap up the show here. If those of you stay, like I said, we'll hand out stuff and let these two get back to their convention. But uh, th thanks, Vince Thank and Adam, you. for for coming on the show. Absolutely. Thank you, Philip, for making the trek here after work. That's right. <laughs> wasn't that far and thank you guys for showing up uh, appreciate it so it wasn't just us huddled in a room here by ourselves uh, but uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna th uh, call it quits here uh, and we'll see you guys in another two weeks we'll be back on our we'll be doing our normal show uh, we'll be at, I think it's just gonna be us I don't think I have a guest schedule for that one but uh, boards and slash live for all of our information our contact stuff but we also have feedback if you've got any uh, feedback for like the show in general for this live show how we could do things better appreciate it and thanks for the people that showed up in the chat I know uh, some of the mics may have been a little bit off but it's a learning process it's iterative process as you say mm -hmm. so uh, thanks everybody and uh, that's that's the show that's show goodnight. That's the show.